distinguished guests, good afternoon and welcome to Pan-Atlantic University's 13th inaugural lecture. The ceremony begins in about two minutes with a faculty procession. Present to please fill up the rows, the front rows. Apart from the first three rows, please occupy the lower part of the auditorium. faculty will begin to prepare for procession. Faculty members, please begin to prepare for procession. I read somewhere so, that King Sunny Day had... Distinguished guests, the procession has begun. Could you please rise?
procession has started. Flag bearer Anthony Edopolo, followed closely by faculty members of the Pan Atlantic University. Session continues. After the members of the faculty, you have the deans of schools. Followed closely again by the inaugural lecturer, Professor Tayo Utubanjo, the university registrar and the vice chancellor in that order. anthem is rendered, followed by the university anthem. The national anthem.
be seated. The Vice Chancellor, members of the Governing Council here present, members of the Pan Atlantic University Senate, principal officers, deans of schools, directors of centers and units, faculty members, staff, students, and alumni of Pan Atlantic University, our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon to you all. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Inase Okonedo, I welcome you all to the 13th inaugural lecture of Pan Atlantic University. Universities are steeped in tradition, and one such tradition at universities is the inaugural lecture. Inaugural lectures provide a platform for newly promoted professors to share their contributions to scholarship, their current research and future research plans with the university community and the general public. The inaugural lecture has a unique feature. It leaves no room for questions. The lecturer delivers his paper and leaves the podium. Professor Tayo Otubanjo, Professor of Marketing at the Lagos Business School, Pan-Atlantic University, will shortly deliver the 13th inaugural lecture of the university. The lecture is titled, Managing the Meanings of Corporate Identity and Corporate Branding, a Social Constructionist Lens. At this juncture, permit me to introduce the persons on the stage. From my rightmost, Dr. Darlington Aholo, Dean, School of Science and Technology. <laughs> Professor Chris Ogbechi, Dean, Lagos Business School. <laughs> Professor Enase Okonedo, Vice Chancellor, Pan Atlantic University. Next to her, we have Professor Tayo Tubanjo, who will deliver the inaugural lecture. I have Dr. Uluwashola Oni, Dean, School of Management and Social Sciences. I am Kingsley Ukoha, the Registrar, Pan Atlantic University. I now invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Enase Okonedo to formally introduce the lecturer. Please welcome Professor Enase Okonade with a round of applause. Good afternoon, distinguished guests. Permit me to stand on the protocol already observed in honor of one of us who would have been seated on the side of the room this afternoon, but sadly passed away in the early hours of Monday morning, Dr. Michael Okolo, the Dean of the School of Media and Communications. I would like to ask that you kindly stand and observe a minute silence in his honor whilst praying for his soul. May the soul of Dr. Michael Okolo and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
Citation of Professor Tayo Otubanjo. Professor Tayo Otubanjo was born in the metropolitan city of Lagos. He attended St. Jude's Primary School, Ibutimeta, Lagos, and completed his secondary school education at St. Fimba's College, Akoka, Lagos. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in accounting from Ogun State University, and in the course of his undergraduate degree program, completed stages one, two, and three of the Nigerian Institute of Public Relations professional examination. The acquisition of this professional qualification set the stage for a career in marketing communications. On the completion of his undergraduate degree, Professor Otuba Njo trained as a journalist at a professional school of journalism. He pursued a postgraduate diploma in journalism at the Nigerian Institute of Journalism, Lagos and immediately proceeded to do a Master of Science degree in marketing with emphasis on corporate communication. Professor Tubanjo began his professional career in marketing communications in the 1990s with a short stint at MCA Sachi and Sachi, a major advertising agency. He moved on very quickly to join CMC Connect Lagos, one of the largest public relations consulting firms of the 90s. At CMC Connect, he worked in market intelligence and had the opportunity of generating market planning insights for the development of strategy for major corporations. The highlights of this function were with Coca-Cola, Fanta, SAP, Microsoft, Pojo, Accenture, UPS, Fanta Black Oran, Shell, and Kakawa Discount House. Following his career at CMC, Market, CMC Connect Lagos, he proceeded to the University of Hull, United Kingdom for a PhD in marketing with emphasis on industry construction of corporate brand identity. His PhD thesis challenged his supervisor's work, defied the positivist tradition, and pioneered research into corporate brand identity from a social constructionist or epistemological point of view. He transitioned to Brunel University, London, in a postgraduate research capacity, where he was highly instrumental to the development of the first MSc degree program in corporate brand management in the United Kingdom. He began his lectureship career at Brunel University, London, teaching undergraduate and postgraduate courses in marketing management and consumer behavior. Professor Tupanjo returned to Nigeria to commence the second phase of his marketing communications career as a brand strategy and account planning director at Center Spread FCB, one of the three largest advertising agencies in Nigeria at the time. In the course of working for Center Spread FCB, Professor Tupanjo carried out brand strategy assignments for national and multinational institutions of note. Some of those include Sky Bank, Wema Bank, Zenith Bank, ITV, MoneyGram, SC Johnson, Edo State's Board of Internal Revenue, just to mention a few. Whilst working as an advertising practitioner at Center Spread FCB, Professor Tubajo was appointed visiting research fellow at Warwick Business School to undertake corporate brand reputation research. Within a month of this appointment, he was offered yet another visiting scholar position to pursue corporate brand leadership research at Spears School of Business, Oklahoma State University. These appointments were made strictly on the strength of his social constructionist epistemological mindset to corporate marketing research. Professor Tubanjos has written over 100 articles focusing mostly on corporate brand identity. His work has appeared in numerous ABS quoted journals of notes, including Academy of Marketing Science Review, Tory Studies, Management Decisions, The Marketing Review, Journal of Products and Brand Management, Corporate Reputation Review, Corporate Communications and International Journal. He has presented papers at several prestigious universities globally, and in 20, 2019, Professor Tubanjo won the Best Paper Award at the Corporate Communications International Conference held at the University of Southern California. Professor Tubanjo is an alumnus of the prestigious IESA Business School, Barcelona, Spain, where he received international faculty development education, which equipped him with case writing and case facilitation skills. 
He also went through the Watson Business School's Global Faculty Development Program, which deepened his research and publication skills. He's lead faculty in charge of the LBS Management Scholars Academy, composed of elite research assistants. Since the commencement of this program seven years ago, Professor Otubanjo has supported well over 30 research assistants in gaining admission into fully funded PAD programs at some of the best universities around the world. Professor Otubanjo offers strategic marketing advisory services to firms. Past and current clients include First Bank, FCMB PLC, Keystone Bank PLC, AXA Mansard, and Alpha Morgan Capital. He has supervised MPhil and PhD thesis in his areas of research to completion and has served as an external examiner to the MPhil and PhD marketing programs at University of Ghana. Professor Otubanjo is an independent non-executive director on the board of Alpha Morgan Capital, an investment marketing institution quoted on Financial Times 2022 as one of the top 50 fastest growing companies in Africa. He also sits on the board of Axiom Learning Solutions Limited, a foremost learning development firm. He is happily married with two children and he enjoys spending time with his family. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Professor Tayo Tubanjo. Thank you. The Vice-Chancellor, Registrar, other Principal Officers of Pan-Atlantic University, the Dean of Lagos Business School, other Deans and Directors, members of the Senate and Congregation, my Lords, Spiritual and Temporal, friends, of the Pan-Atlantic University and Lagos Business School, special guests, erudite academics, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. May I offer you a warm welcome to Lagos Business School. Before I proceed with my lecture, kindly permit me to acknowledge a number of preceding uh, predecessors who have graced this stage. First is the former vice chancellor of this great institution, Professor Joan Eleido, Professor Patrick Utomi, Professor Emeo Biakulo, Professor Chantal Apie, Professor Lawali Ajayi. Professor Fabian Ajogu, S.A.N., Professor James Sayo, the Dean of Lagos Business School, Professor Chris Ogbeche, Professor Olu Yombo, Onofoorkon, our first female Vice Chancellor, Professor Enase, en Professor Enase Okonedo, our Associate Dean at Lagos Business School, Professor Yinka David West, and Professor Perekuna Erega. The desire for a positive corporate identity and a valuable corporate brand is high on the agenda of business leaders. Decision makers understand that a well-articulated corporate identity and brilliantly expressed corporate brand serves as a central central force for customer recognition, market differentiation, strategic visibility, and employee motivation. Today, the practice of corporate identity and corporate branding are seen as valuable tools for creating stakeholder awareness, inspiring high product quality, 
and driving customer loyalty. C-suit executives are well informed about the power of corporate identity and corporate branding in enticing the right investors, enhancing business valuation, and attracting talents. The sustained interest in the expression of a positive corporate identity and corporate brand is manifested in the substantial marketing expenditures on these tools, particularly in banking and telecom sectors. A report by Benson 2020 estimates that in 2019 alone, Nigeria's first-year banks spent as much as 40 billion naira on activities critical to the expression of corporate identity and corporate branding. The likes of MTN Nigeria and other organizations of repute spent a whooping sum of 143.7 billion on similar activities in 2020 alone. A desire for corporate identity and corporate branding first emerged in the 1990s when the banking sector began to change the designation of corporate image managers from public relations to corporate identity managers. This change was meant to capture the real essence of the role. The defunct Platinum Bank, which later became Bank PHB, was the first organization in Nigeria to make such a, such a, such a shift. Sheung Shoyinka, a colleague, and the first marketing professional to occupy this role was charged with the responsibility of building a strong corporate brand and corporate identity for Platinum Bank. Besides the business leaders in banking, insurance, and telecoms, who fully understand and appreciate these strategic tools, there has also been a rise in the number of leaders in conservative sectors such as energy, agriculture, healthcare, road construction, and real estate who are beginning to devote their energies and resources to corporate identity and corporate branding. Federal, state, local governments, and their parastatals too caught the bug. Interestingly, public sector institutions and even non-government organizations are demonstrating an understanding of the impact of these tools and are devoting huge resources to them. The rise in interest in corporate identity and corporate branding has not gone unnoticed by academic researchers who devote their energies to understanding the meaning, management, and measurement of these concepts. A vast amount of academic and practitioner literature contributes to the development of theory in these fields. The increased number of articles in marketing and business journals provide evidence in this regard. Academic conferences devoted to the generation of new knowledge in these disciplines has been on the rise. In the last three decades, there has been a rise in the profiles of international conferences of repute that are devoted to corporate identity and corporate branding. These conferences include the International Conference, the International Corporate Identity Group Conference, the Corporate and Marketing Communications Conference, and the Corporate Communications International Conference. These papers presented at these conferences appear in some of the most prestigious ABS-quoted journals. These include the Academy of Management Review, Journal of Marketing Science, British Journal of Management, Psychology and Marketing, Academy of Marketing Science Review, European Journal of Marketing, California Management Review, Corporate Reputation Review, Journal of Product and Brand Management, and Corporate Communications and International Journal. I am happy to report that some of my work have appeared in some of these international journals of repute. The heightened interest in corporate identity and corporate branding 
is made even more visible given the introduction of these disciplines as some of the most prestigious business schools in the world. Today, corporate identity and corporate branding models are delivered at Harvard, Columbia, Stan Business School. Others include Kellogg School of Management, Rotterdam School of Management, Manchester Business School, University of Leeds, Norwich Business School of the University of East Anglia, and University of London's Goldsmith College, just to mention a few. Five multidisciplinary factors explain the reason, explain the rise in interest in these nascent academic disciplines. First, are the marketing-led factors of shortened product life cycles, desire for differentiation, business diversification, consolidation and higher rates of media inflation. Other factors included the redefinition of businesses from a marketing perspective, increasing recognition of the value of integrated marketing communications, better approaches to market segmentation, rising number of crisis situations, copious product innovation, and a reorientation towards customer service. Second are socioeconomic factors of economic recession, value change, rise in the level of environmental awareness and the, and the challenges of privatization and commercialization and the divestment of government stocks. Third, a business and strategy induced factors of globalization of markets and production, stiffer competition, the rising cost of business operations, and crisis in many areas of industry. Others include increased desire for re-engineering and many other factors which place severe challenges on national and international competition. Fourth, are scandalous events involving high-profile organizations. We cannot forget in a hurry Enron and world comes massive corporate fraud. The Shell Ogoni crisis is in our memory. The BP, the BP oil spill off the coast of Louisiana is unforgettable. The sinking of Exxon Valdez on the Blight Reef of Prince William remains a bad reference point. These and other scandals shook stakeholder confidence. The damage arising from these scandals support the need for corporate identity and corporate differentiation through corporate branding. Fifth, are changes in social attitudes leading to increased awareness and concern for, for ecological issues. Stakeholders now have a greater appreciation of the balance of nature and effect of the, and the balance of the balance of nature and the effect and the effect of human activity on this balance today stakeholders have become increasingly vigilant and critical of problems resulting from the failure to protect the environment consequently many organizations pursue green activities that will create and personify positive corporate reputation. As interest in the concepts of corporate identity and corporate branding grows, so has the debate concerning their meanings and management. For years, authors disagreed over the meaning and management of these concepts, given the fog that enveloped them. The fog that contributed to the reckless, promiscuous, and dubious use of the concepts by practitioners and academic authors. The multidisciplinary perspectives from which these concepts are at times approached add to the forces contributing to the disagreement. My teaching, research, and consulting interests in corporate identity and corporate branding arose through various phases of my professional career at CMC Connect Lagos and Central Spread FCB, two of the largest and more reputable and the most reputable public relations and advertising agencies in this country. 
As a young public relations practitioner at CMC Connect, I was schooled to manage major corporate brands such as Coca-Cola, Microsoft, UPS, Shell, SAP, SAP rather, Anderson Consulting, Accenture, Kakawa Discount House, Fanta, and Fanta Black Current. Of these accounts, the lessons that I learned on the Anderson, Anderson Accenture Identity Change Project was the most profound. My experience working on this corporate identity change team, my experience working with the corporate identity, identity change team, at Anderson Consulting exposed me to the practical role of corporate identity. To serve as a reminder, as for Anderson, the, the defunct global auditing firm and its partner, Anderson Consulting, split in 2000 following an acrimonious battle over monies the consulting firm owed Anderson, owed Arthur Anderson. Following an arbitrator's ruling, Anderson Consulting in America changed its name and corporate identity to Accenture at the cost of $175 million. Its Nigerian partner had no choice. It complied with its principle. My experience on this project exposed me to the corporate identity assimilation process, the cultural implementation of corporate identity, and the syndication of corporate identity, corporate identity change across a variety of media channels. Prior to Anderson Consulting Corporate Identity, my plan was to pursue a PhD in marketing with emphasis on green marketing under the guide of Professor Andy Craig, who was at that time a senior lecturer at Cardiff University. However, the Anderson Identity Change Project reformed my view of corporate communications completely, so much so that I changed my PhD research plan to corporate identity very quickly. I became an apostle of corporate identity, even though this concept was not new to me. My MSc dissertation, written much earlier, had focused on the impact of corporate identity on customer perceptions. Ladies and gentlemen, I did not come into the, into the academia by accident. I planned it. I aimed for it. The almighty God approved it. It was a personal strategic goal. It was a personal strategic goal. I was initially in the corporate world only to gain real-world knowledge and experiences that will serve as useful reference points in the classroom. To bring my plan to life, I enrolled in a full-time PhD program in the UK with four, goals in, for, with four goals in mind. First is to conduct research into the construction of corporate identity. Second is to complete my PhD successfully. Third is to assume a faculty position at a business school, and fourth was to rise from lecturer to full professor. In line with my plan, I got a position as junior faculty at Brunel University London, where I was presented with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to design and develop the initial comprehensive curriculum for the introduction of an MSc degree program in corporate brand management under the leadership of Professor T.C. Mellower, a, distingu a distinguished corporate identity and corporate branding scholar. On the completion of my PhD, I returned to Nigeria with great excitement to take up a role as director, strategy and account planning at Central Spread FCB, Nigeria's third largest advertising agency after GDB and Inside Communications. At Center Spread, I supported the development of brand strategy documents that gave direction to the execution of advertising campaigns for all clients. It was my job to work with others to ensure that creative execution teams maintained a strategic focus on brand guidelines. Some 
of the notable corporate brands I was responsible for were Sky Bank, FCMB, Zenith Bank, Wema Bank, MoneyGram, SC Johnson, a dope board of internal revenue, Starcoms, Multilinks, and so on and so forth. In the course of my career at Center Spread, I was offered visiting scholar positions at Warwick, Uni Warwick University, University of Warwick, and Oklahoma State University. Both appointments were made purely on the strength of my social constructionist epistemological mindset to the study of corporate identity and corporate branding. These appointments spurred me to leave the advertising industry for Lagos Business School. And I have been very, very happy here since my first day as faculty. My brand strategy experience on each of the accounts that I handled taught me how to critically identify the needs of customers, which competitors often overlook. The knowledge drawn from these assignments prepared me. It set the stage for effective teaching and research at Lagos Business School. The aim of this inaugural is to review my previous and current academic research which has focused on corporate identity and corporate branding from a social constructionist epistemological perspective and draw on social liberalism theory of political sociology to set the stage for further research into the management of connected stakeholders in corporate brand communities. Two professional philosophies that I inculcated throughout my career in public relations and advertising shaped my academic thought process. First, I believe that an organization's positive or negative corporate reputation evolves through the mental processing of the formal and informal lines of strategic and non-strategic activities. Mental processing in this context would, could be conceived as meanings within the constructionist paradigm. Second, I was schooled that there is a mandatory symbiosis of repetitive actions and responses between corporate brands and stakeholders. This lesson is corroborated and strengthened by Rogers 2011's network intelligence theory, which holds that customers are no longer viewed as isolated individuals, but are seen as dynamic and interactive participants in a network. Customers are constantly responding, connecting, and sharing among themselves and with businesses. Distinguished scholars, colleagues, ladies and, gen and gentlemen, it is these interrelated professional philosophies learned from the distinguished, from distinguished advertising and PR practitioners that define my journey into the academic world of branding. In the first year of my PhD pursuit, one subject, philosophical foundations in business, shaped my academic career and marked the defining moment of my research. It confirmed my professional beliefs about management of corporate brands. That subject introduced me to the dominant epistemological paradigms in the social sciences, including positivism, constructionist, Interpretivist, pragmatism, subjectivist, subjectivist, subjectivism, and critical. My epistemological understanding of positivism, then and now, is that reality is measurable, and there is a single reality to truth. Contrary to positivism, the constructionist paradigm contends that, that there is no single reality to truth. Rather, it is created by individuals who interact in groups. Therefore, reality is interpreted. Pragmatism assumes that reality is constantly negotiated, debated, and interpreted in the light of its usefulness in new and unpredictable situations. Here, the best solution is one that solves problems. Finding out is the means. Change is the aim. Subjectivism is what we perceive to be real, and all knowledge is purely a matter of perspective. 
The critical paradigm defines reality as a socially constructed entity that is under constant internal influence. Reality and knowledge are socially constructed and influenced by power relations within groups and societies. Of these epistemologies, the constructionist paradigm quickly appealed to me. This is so, given my professional lineage towards the creation of meanings through repetitive interconnected actions between organizations and stakeholders. Social constructionism became the lens through which I view corporate branding and the basis from which most of my research articles emerged. The dominant debate within corporate branding literature is rooted in the metaphysical realm of positivism. These studies present assertive and non-critical theories grounded on the assumption that the objective physical and social world exists independently of humans. Positivism discounts the subjective world in which humans and corporate brands interact. It contends that the existence of priority fixed relationships within the corporate branding framework can only be identified and tested through hypothetic deductive logic and analysis. Unfortunately, positivism does not accommodate some of the critical issues that promote proper and effective formation of meanings across the entire corporate brand management process. The positivist lens to corporate branding demonstrates the mandatory presence of interaction between actors, but it has failed to recognize the inevitable ongoing and never ending nature of social interaction through which corporate brands evolve. The notion of ongoing, outrightly discounted in positivism, is crucial to the development of corporate branding. Most positivist studies on corporate branding disregard the important roles of the pillars of social order, direction, and stability in the branding, brand formation process. These pillars provide the basis, platform, and structural foundation on which social interaction, interactions between organizations and stakeholders occur. Positivist models grant the interpretation of corporate branding meanings to the stakeholder, which fails to accommodate the generation of interpretations and meanings through habitualization process of frequent and ongoing repetition of organizational activities. Positivist literature on corporate branding promotes the development of desired corporate reputation through the nurturing of relationships between organizations and stakeholders. Unfortunately, there is no detailed conversation in these studies to demonstrate how positive corporate reputations are created without habitual and ongoing interactions with stakeholders. Positivists argue that the end of product, the end of product of the relationship between organizations and stakeholders is corporate reputation. However, such studies are often bereft of business history, an important, mandatory, and inevitable component of the corporate brand building process. Even when they do, they do not tell us how business history, an important and accumulation of events, shaping the personality of organizations over time, impacts the development of corporate reputation. At the beginning of my academic journey, I was introduced to the works of Latois, Barnes, Steve Wooger, Nor Setina, Bart, Chandler, Socio, Hall, and of course, the groundbreaking work of Berger and Lukman, who took social constructionist theory from the doldrums and gave it a foothold. I believe that um, figures three to 11 give pictorial representation of the pioneering works of the listed authors. Ladies and gentlemen, those, those textbooks gave me a headache during my PhD. And my supervisor at that time demanded nothing but excellence. But I'm, I'm happy he did, demanded excellence from me. 
of these authors, Braga and Lukman's 1966 groundbreaking work on the social construction of reality together with Stuart Hall's influential study on cultural representation has been most beneficial. This is because the key arguments in these studies address how groups and the society at large make meanings of all human activities. The reasons for following Berger and Lukman and Stuart Hall will be discussed in detail shortly. But for now, I turn to the dominant arguments in Berger and Lukman 1966 and Hall 1997. Berger and Lukman argued that man alone cannot create a meaningful world. Society is created by humans through human interactions which these authors conceptualize as habitualization. Habitualization in this context captures how any action that is repeated frequently becomes cast into a pattern, which can then be performed again in the future in the same manner and with the same economical effort. Habitualization Habitualized or repeated actions create meanings that become embedded through individual routine activities. Four conceptual positions underscore and breathe life into why I follow Berger and Lukman. First, one of the key ontological arguments in Berger and Lukman's work addresses how individuals, groups, and other actors within the society interact. The key argument here is that in the course of interactions, meanings are developed through mental representations of actors' actions. This argument is characterized by the belief that meaning is socially constructed by at least two actors. Work, Berg and Lukman's work indicate that things themselves do not mean, and man alone cannot fix meanings. Meanings emerge through ongoing social interactions among individuals. Thus, individuals and groups adopt representational systems that that construct meaning for target audiences and communicate core messages to internal and external stakeholders. For clarification purpose, the notion of meaning addresses the interpretation of the relationship between the signifier and the signified the signifier and its user, or the signifier and other signs. Central to meaning is interpretation, a reconstruction of actors' thoughts, ideas, concepts, objects, things, and activities. The role of interpretation is to give actual meaning to signs. is to give actual meaning to signs of interactions against the backdrop of a given situation. Interpretation gives meaning to representation of organizations. An important ontological argument in Berger and Lukman is that it addresses how meanings are generated. Uh, It focuses on the habitualization process. Berger and Lukman, um, for Berger and Lukman, the frequent and consistent repetition of human activities habitualizes human actions. Importantly, habitualized actions generate, carry, and retain meanings through the repetition of human activities. Habitualization becomes the form on which meanings are generated. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, given the time limit, I am afraid that I will not be able to present the remaining two positions and sections three three and four of this text. I encourage those interested in reading about my work to do so privately. In the meantime, may may I call on you, in the meantime, may I call on you to come with me to paragraph five of the text. An important project which strengthens my research and scholarship within the realm and framework of corporate brand management characterizes the nature 
of my current academic research. The project is entitled The Organic Solidarity Model of Corporate Brand Management. In 2015, two colleagues and I explored the development of a corporate brand as an evolution through the mandatory but independent components of mission, core values, value proposition, logo, and slogan. The research recognized that these independent components, which is often left unintegrated, tend to lead in different directions or diverge entirely from the essence of their organization, thus resulting in corporate brand chaos. In order to <coughs> pardon me, in order to circumvent chaos, I propose the consideration of the organic solidarity of the organic solidarity 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 model of brand management. In 2015, sorry, the 2015 study presented a comprehensive review of existing corporate brand management models and identified five epistemological foundations underpinning the modeling of corporate brand management. These epistemological foundations included positivism, post-positivism, critical realism, constructivism, and cultural representation. Table two gives detailed insight into these epistemological dimensions and the authors associated with each. The review of models helps helped to establish the absence of any sociological theory that could aid the integration of the mandatory but independent components of corporate brand management. Against this backdrop, I introduced the Dokamian Organic Solidarity Theory, which suggests that actors within modern societies act independently, given their differentiated roles within the framework of division of labor. For instance, farmers lean on medical doctors for healthy living. Doctors lean on farmers for food. Lawyers need teachers to complete their degrees, and teachers need lawyers for the dispensation of justice. In such societies, actors interact in accordance with their obligations to others and society, and, and society as a whole. For Duquesne, disentangling these interdependent roles will produce a chaotic society. The organic solidarity model of corporate brand management depicts the building of a cohesive corporate brand. The model is grounded in the Kimian organic solidarity theory which focuses on the interdependence of corporate brand elements and interactions within the business environment. This model consists of, brand, of five brand elements, including mission statements, core values, value proposition, slogan, and corporate logo. The development of a cohesive corporate brand begins with a review of competitors' mission statements, a step that support managers' efforts to identify the critical points of differences within with their competitors, leveraging on insights generated, generated from a unique mission provides a competitive advantage for organizations. The development of a mission statement is interdependent of the message embedded in an organization's unique value proposition and corporate core values. Decision makers must further ensure that there is a measure of interdependence between the unique value proposition and the core values, and between the, core, and between the unique value proposition and the slogan. The same rule of interdependence manifests between the slogan and the corporate logo on the one hand, and core values and the corporate logo on the other. Put another way, the model encourages the building of interdependence among corporate brand elements to establish a single theme that is evident among each of the competitors within the model. Finally, the model is not independent, but interdependent. 
there is a continuous flow of a theme as demonstrated by the two-dimensional arrows drawn to depict circular interaction among the brand elements. For example, a change in the mission statement should equally lead to a change in the corporate brand elements to maintain <coughs> cohesion. The goal of corporate brand cohesion is to develop a one voice corporate brand. Amazon, Amazon Incorporation, an American e commerce company founded by Bezos in 1994, is one of the world's large, largest online retail companies. Bezos founded this company on the culture and philosophy of truly caring for customers. It has carried on in this spirit. From its inception, Amazon's mission statement has focused on the customer. The mission states to be Earth's most customer-centric company, to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything that they might want to buy online. The Amazon mission statement was unique at the time. It, com it, commenced, it commenced business because e-commerce organizations were few in number then. Today, they've come a long way. Their customer-centric mission statement is directly linked to an independent, to and dependent upon its core values as shown in the expressed obsession for customers, customer care. Similarly, the core values lean heavily on the value proposition that describes a desire to deliver a positive corporate, positive customer experience. This in interdependence is buoyed by the slogan and meaning of the corporate logo, both of which relay their commitment to customer centricity and customer experience. The concept of interdependence manifests through a focus on the customer. In essence, interdependence emerges through the attention paid to the customer in all corporate branding components, including the mission, core values, value proposition, corporate logo, and slogan. There, there was a time when organizations controlled and purposefully built their corporate brands in an effort to influence consumer perceptions of their intent and philosophies. Brands were treated like beautiful and carefully constructed statues and sculptures considerable legal power was wielded to protect, preserve, and defend the look and feel of corporate brands. However, the emergence of internet-based social media, social media sites, keep families, friends, colleagues, neighbors, and customers connected to corporate brands that have found new exposure through this multimodal network of social actors. Today, you find people on YouTube with a huge influence on corporate brands. You could, have, you could have employees and stakeholders across multiple channels who own and manage the corporate brand. This, was created, this has created a dissonance between the traditional principle processes and practices of corporate brand management that was shrouded in beautifully constructed protective statutes versus the vastly more complex worldwide environment of connected stakeholders. Connected stakeholders in communities are intensely power, immensely powerful. They are people-centric, empathetic, connected, open, and democratic. They are also challenging to manage. They are also challenging to manage. They are non-linear and composed of multiple parties and platforms. They are global made of culturally diverse members. They have a point of view and they are not ex afraid to express it. They live in the moment and don't wait to act. They aren't asking permission to use a corporate brand on their own terms. The question is, how do we shift our thinking our corporate, about corporate branding to accommodate new diverse community of connected stakeholders? 
whose actions have consequences for corporate brands. How do we build, nurture, and sustain corporate brand communities moving forward? Also, if corporate brands are becoming organic, living, and responsive things, and no longer rigid, rigid and fixed things, how can they be rejuvenated by everyone involved in the management of the corporate brand? How do we engage the community to feel empowered to explore the implications of a corporate brand? To address these problems, I propose the introduction of a, man, a brand management model driven by the social liberalism theory to lead the management of a diverse community of connected stakeholders. Let me take you to paragraph 6.2. Social liberalism promotes the principle of the common good in conjunction with the freedom of individuals. A good number of corporate brands are leading a variety of initiatives for the common good by investing in the development of green brands and sustainability initiatives to protect and support communities. Dangote PLC works through the Aliko Dangote Foundation to enhance, opportun to enhance opportunities for social change through strategic invest investments that improve health and well-being, promote quality education and broaden economic empowerment opportunities. Similarly, Coca-Cola Enterprises Nigeria partners with and supports local NGOs to develop and implement projects uh, implement projects to drive environmentally environmental sustainability the principle of freedom in the social liberalism theory is promoted by numerous corporate brands that allow internal and external stakeholders to drop components of their brand expressions for instance coca-cola gave its internal and external stakeholders the freedom to drop its name to accommodate the name of its Australian consumers through its 2011 Share a Coke campaign. Uh, okay, so the, the, a, a copy of that campaign is um, on the screen. Here in Nigeria, we had the same experience. Share a Coke with Shola. I'm sure you remember Share a Coke with uh, Kemi, Share a Coke with uh, Anjola, Share a Coke with uh, Daddy, Share a Coke with Mommy. Social liberalism recognizes the freedom of individuals but promotes, or, uh, promotes government inter intervention to circumvent chaos and address challenges of poverty, welfare, infrastructure, health care, education, and climate change. Corporate, corporate brands also promote customer freedom, but brand managers intervene to prevent the removal of of sacred brand expressions that could th threaten the loss of meaning for the brand and create chaos in the marketplace. Coca-Cola allows distributors to replace its corporate name with customer names, but unique components of brand exp expressions, such as the color, wave, and the contour, are revered, valued, and therefore untouchable. So when you see some of those bottles, you see the names of people, they take out the name of Coca-Cola, they put your name, but the contour is kept uh, because it is revered, it is valued, and it is, it is believed that it is untouchable. The concept of freedom within the social liberalism theory gives room for internal stakeholders or corporate brand managers to freely give their own interpretation of the corporate brand within the context of their businesses or markets. Google allows its corporate logo to be elaborated, adjusted, and made meaningful based on events, weather, or time of the year. The social liberalism principle of freedom encourages internal and external stakeholders of a corporate brand to explore. At Disney World, a janitor began drawing Disney characters with its mop, and kids started following him. 
even seeking him out. Eventually, the janitor began to teach kids how to draw with mops. This spontaneous activity was inspired by a janitor who understood the brand, acted on it, and made it relevant. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to have shared the highlights of my future academic research at Lagos Business School. Although my work on this project is still at preliminary stage, nevertheless, this presentation offers insight into my focus for the future. In conclusion, the knowledge I have acquired in teaching, research, and consulting leans heavily on the short but valuable professional experiences I acquired in public relations and advertising pre and post PhD. Indeed, at the beginning, indeed, Indeed, at the beginning of this inaugural speech, I shared two major lessons learned during my time in brand and advertising public relations subsectors that shaped my academic career. First, corporate reputation evolves through mental processing of meanings derived from formal and informal lines of strategic and non-strategic activities of organizations. Second, a mandatory symbiosis of repetitive actions and repetitive responses between corporate brands and stakeholder, stakeholders create meanings across markets. These lessons, which are a snapshot of the corporate communications process, spurred my interest in the association between corporate identity and corporate branding and the meanings that they generate with stakeholders. My contributions to the field of corporate identity and corporate branding are numerous. However, permit me to roll out just some of the highlights in my research and academic career. My most significant contribution to corporate market, marketing and business research was the introduction of social constructionist epistemology into corporate identity and the broader discipline of corporate marketing. This, this contribution espoused my ongoing, the, the ongoing nature of the meaning of corporate identity and how it is trapped in the ongoing wheel of change. The next major contribution emerged from numerous studies that introduced the adoption of the cultural representation theory of social construction into the meaning and management of corporate branding. Contributions from my research have taught me that the meanings that stakeholders make of corporate brands are deeply rooted in culture. Meanings are more powerful than perceptions or image. Therefore, meanings are difficult to change when they are perceived to be bad. One example illustrates this conclusion. For decades, Volvo has Volvo was construed as a safe brand. Over time, most auto brands acquired and installed safety gadgets in their cars, thus making Volvo safety claims meaningless. Volvo, sale, Volvo sales plummeted. The brand quickly repositioned itself as a luxury car, competing with the caddies. It didn't work. It repositioned again as an aesthetic car, this didn't quite grab the attention of customers. After numerous failed repositionings, Volvo had no choice but to return to his original message of safety. This is just one of the research-led conversations on meanings that I deliver to business leaders in the classroom. In the area of consulting, my focus is on strategic brand development, value proposition, and strategic marketing. The knowledge I have acquired on managing the relationship between meanings and brands inspires me to always, 
to always subject advertising campaigns to semiotic deconstructive processes. So in essence, if advertising agencies in the course of their, in the course of their campaigns, exercises, subject their copies to semiotic deconstructive, uh, deconstructive processes, perhaps some of the uh, mess we find in the media about corporate brands, probably that will be reduced drast uh, drastically. This enables us to predetermine the meanings that stakeholders are likely to make of our campaigns. Madam Vice Chancellor, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. God bless you all. Thank you. You may be seated, please. So we start our thanks, first of all, to Professor Tayo Tubanjo, whose commitment to scholarship is the reason we're gathered here. In a special way, we say thanks to his family for the support that he has received. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Inacio Conedo, I want to thank you all for gracing the 13th inaugural lecture of Pan Atlantic University. In a special way, we want to thank uh, the staff and student volunteers who have uh, planned and executed this event. Um, in a short while, we will close the program. Um, but just to make it a few small announcements, um, the academic procession will leave the auditorium in the reverse order, and while the procession you know, is going out or exiting the auditorium, we are all to remain standing until that process is completed. Cocktails will be served at the foyer outside the auditorium. Once again, thank you for coming, and may God grant you journey messages to your various destinations. The University Anthem, please rise.
Thank <laughs> you. 